Alrighty, let's go. So I was able to choose what the difficulty scale is for here, so this is completely unreliable. We're going with a three. At times it might be a four. At times it might be a two. It'll probably be closer to a three to a four the whole time. This is me giving a lecture after all. So the resources for this, one is the book we've been reading in Frontiers. Another is a book that we might read in Frontiers later, Necessary Existence, by the same guy, plus another author. The other is a book by a guy who's long dead, and then I will also be reading an excerpt from this book, but y'all don't want me to spend too much time on this book, as this is beyond a five. So, what will we be doing today? I'm going to present at least two arguments, and these are all in the broad theory of contingency. What is that? I'll tell you later. There's a basic argument, an argument that's slightly more complicated, but better. And then I will be showing how these actually lead us to God and maybe sort of kind of get us close to Christianity. That will be like the last two slides. So what's contingency? Actually, before that, I'm going to do a sidetrack because Sam Blackman said it'd be nice to uh, explain to people why people care about this at all. And so we're going to do that. So consider these two inconsistent claims. Everything has an external explanation, and the totality of reality does not have an external relation, explanation. Both of these appear to be true on first glance. Anything you look for, you just don't go, yeah, that chair, it just exists. Nothing explains why it exists. It came into existence, no reason a grand mystery. So it seems, yeah, most things have an external relationship. But then when you look at everything, well, everything can't have an external relationship because there's nothing outside of everything. So there's nothing outside of everything to explain everything. So something's unfortunate here. I have me, my blob of everything. I, promise, I literally looked up on Google Images, blob, and the sea lion came up, and so that's why it's a sea lion. It's not just because I love seals and sea lions, but as you can see, I've made it maroon looking to emphasize that it's everything, because what is there outside of A&M? I don't know, never been. So we have the next question, which is the one you're pondering. Why the heck do I care? Michael cares, Michael's not acting like he cares, but he cares, but why do you care? See that seal over there? That seal wants to have a nap. You can tell it's actually a seal because it doesn't have ears. The last one was a sea lion, it has ears. So you know something's a seal versus a sea lion. Well, so I'm giving a couple reasons to entice you. You can know the ultimate structure of reality if we resolve this puzzle. That's pretty cool. Don't you want your parents to know you came out of university knowing all of the secrets of the universe? Or at least all of the ones that are cool enough to care about? So that's like the ultimate structure. By knowing just the structure of something doesn't tell you what that thing actually is in itself. But we might be able to figure out that too, so we might know the fundamental nature of reality. It's pretty epic. And letting my cards out, you already knew this was going to end up in God. This is a Christian organization. This lets us know more about God. So now we have a skeptical seal over here. And this skeptical seal is questioning whether or not I can actually deliver on any of my promises. How on earth could we know the fundamental nature of reality? How do we know there is a fundamental nature to reality? You know, that's a big question for a little mind for which we generally have very little resources to accomplish. But to that I say, how could we know we can't know unless we try to know? So I'm just inviting you all to go on this journey with me. And if we fall apart and fail to get to our goal, then we'll know we can't get there. But nothing wrong with trying. So he will. And then being a very skeptical seal who knows how this is eventually going to turn out, the seal says, well, you already have a, a specific end goal you like. Isn't this just your way of finding a nice, happy route to the end goal that you want? On one hand, that's somewhat true, probably. Can't control everything that I think. On the other hand, there have been many atheists who went on this same rabbit hole and came to a similar conclusion, such as William Rowe, who wrote one of the books that I put up on the wall, and Richard Gale. Both of them defended in print 
that you can have a perfectly fine and workable argument for God from these. They didn't themselves fully endorse them, but they said you can. And then one of the other authors who wrote the other two books, he did just become a Christian from this. So there are many who have accepted this argument. And I would wager that as far as philosophical arguments go, the argument I'm presenting to you all in one form or another dates back to roughly the Greek philosopher Anaximander. So it is the second oldest argument in human history that we have documentation of, at least in the West. So this, this argument I'm about to give you all has been around. So it's probably kind of good if it stayed around. So now I'm just going to define some stuff. Since I've been using words like contingency, well, these aren't too hard to comprehend. So if something is necessary, if it must be the case, it can't not be the case. It's necessary. It's got to be the case. 2 plus 2 equals 4. Can't be 5, can't be 3. That's the way it is. Ain't no way you can rework things in such a way that the world is coherent and works without you ending up with 2 plus 2 equaling 4. That's just the way things are. You can't change that. Contingent is everything else, at least the stuff that exists. Anything, you, me, my beloved seals, the chairs in this room, were probably not necessary. The world could have been slightly different. None of us pop up. Could be infinite ways for the world to go without any of us showing up. I think we fit pretty strongly in the contingent scale. So I will be defending two steps of an argument tonight. Stage one, there is something necessary. Stage two, it's probably God. Or at least God is our best candidate explanation for this specific fact by a lot. So now I'm going to offer two signs of contingency. These are little gateways that we have of reason for figuring out whether or not something is not necessary. And so I think that the two most obvious ones that we can deal with are what I'm labeling difference contingency, things which could have been different, most notably, it seems that they couldn't exist or that they could have not existed. So we have my two statements here are, suppose you were a different height than you are right now, well, then you would be different. Seems not that difficult to imagine you could have been a different height. So imagine you could have been very different. Now you might say, uh, well, could I, could me choosing to be at Chick-fil-A right now indicate that I'm contingent? I'm not too sure about that. That just seems to be a choice you make and not something affecting you as a being yourself. But something like I could get my arm chopped off and I'd be now armless, that seems closer to showing actual contingency in something. And the other one, which I think is a bit stronger, which we'll get to in my more advanced argument, is dependence contingency, but where something exists, but its existence depends on some prior thing to allow for it to exist, or at least some simultaneously existing thing. So good get to the example later of, if we get rid of all of the laws of physics, how many of us are going to be able to get out of this room alive? Sam. Yes, that seems reasonable. All right, so now the seal is waving goodbye. We have run out of seals for this presentation. Otherwise, I would be spending the whole time talking about seals. But there's a cute seal to say goodbye to us. Uh, which is more dangerous, a seal or a sea lion? Sea lion. I just wanted to get okay. that out of the way. So now, seals. now, as always, we have to bring in Alvin and Carol. And so when dealing with advocating for theism, I think we, we should have a little breakdown based somewhat in my experience trying to advocate for theism to y'all before in this type of lecture. What should Carol say to a claim of why should I believe in God? Well, what do you know? <coughs> ah, there it is. So, um, this is not the modal logical argument, but it is a modal argument. You'll notice that my boy Alvin was not expecting this. I think most of y'all were probably expecting this. I, I've done this before, but 
As you can see, Carol has decimated the competition with her brilliant argument, which convinced no one because they don't know what she's saying, but she clearly knows what she's talking about. Something like that, you know? So we're, we're going we're gonna to try to uh, be a bit, bit different than that. Try something a little simpler. Over there, we have Rob Coons, who I think is the closest to the framework I took here. Everyone likes Rob Coons, except us. He's at TU, so we can, we can disregard his opinion after we have taken his good argument from him and every other good argument he makes. But starting with the first premise. So this is going to be an argument from difference contingency. So every argument which could have failed to exist has an external explanation for why it exists. I think that's particularly plausible. David? What do you mean by external explanation? We'll get to that. I'm going to have a slide defending this. But for the most part, it just kind of means any prior state of affairs that gives some reason or another for why this object exists. So a very broad idea of explanation. So like your parents provide an exp external explanation of you, as does like the laws of physics occurring in this room right now to keep you together and stuff. So a lot of things do a lot of explanation. And as we'll see, explanation doesn't have to be this like one-to-one -one thing where one thing explains another. And it, if it doesn't explain it unless that thing absolutely happens, because explanations don't require their conclusions to occur with absolute certainty. They just need to allow for this event to occur. Premise two, the universe is an object that could have failed to exist. By universe here, we can just mean if you think that our universe is all of the stuff, then it means that. If you think there's a multiverse too, then it means that. If you think there's more than a multiverse and there's something bigger than that, well, then just add that to the list. Just universe is a good shorthand, though. So we can conclude from these two statements that the universe has an external explanation for why it exists. So we'll defend premise one now, as David asked. So this is a version of a principle of sufficient reason. This is the thing which I was placing at as far back as an Anaximander for, you know, things that exist, there's some sufficient reason for why they exist. And I'm going to say that this principle we have here is just about the best one that we can come up with for explaining this fact. It's real nice and simple, just a sentence. It works for just about anything. You know, if you can think of a simpler explanation that explains all of the data, then by Occam's razor, you're allowed to keep that one. But until then, Occam's razor is decisively on my side. And um, this one, I think, is the most interesting, coming from Jason McGill, who is an atheist. McGill says that if this principle of sufficient reason is not true, then science is doomed to fail one day. We will eventually get to a point where some scientific phenomena occur for literally no reason whatsoever, at which point they are no longer examinable, and science will simply stop that day. We will no longer be able to dig any deeper into reality. And everything that comes after that, we will just have to acknowledge that it all, it all goes back to a big mystery, and there's no explaining why. This is actually the Trotter Prize. Uh, Sean Carroll defends this view. He says that the goal of science is just to get to the part where everything breaks down into, and that's just the way it is, and that's just the way it is. And McGill says, that's a terrible idea. So McGill has defended a, said, we have very good pragmatic reasons. So unless we have very overwhelming evidence to think this is false, we should at the very least act like it's true. And then Rob Coons has said, yeah, this is also generally necessary for a knowledge of any fact. That is to say that if you think you have reliable knowledge of situations, part of what that involves is to say that all of my knowledge doesn't randomly pop into my head for no reason, and that chaos all around me isn't occurring, which I am simply interpreting as reason. But 
if this thing were not true, then it's really hard to explain why we don't see things popping in and out of existence with no reason whatsoever. And that's an issue. Because at the very least, for any object of ordinary experience, it has never been a valid candidate explanation to say, uh, yeah, the washing machine isn't working because of literally no reason. We might say that figuratively, but we don't actually mean that absolutely nothing has occurred and this is the explanation for the state of affairs that is, my washing machine is broken. And so I'm going to say anytime we think that there's a branch in reality, something could exist, something couldn't exist, then if we get, find a thing that exists, it's probably some prior condition of reality that explains why it exists. And I'd say we're as confident of this principle as we are confident of anything else we know. Moving on. The universe itself, this one's going to be faster. So if the universe is just made up of contingent parts, then I don't think contingent parts can build up a necessary whole in the same sense that, as you can see, we have a red brick wall. How many more red bricks do you have to add to the red brick wall until the red brick wall is black? It's just not going to turn black. Red bricks don't make black walls. These are just not the right material to build a necessary thing. And then here is where I take a slight detour from just pure reasoning and enter into random science that I know little about. But Einstein field equations are cool. And so one of my favorite philosophers, Kenneth Pierce, has driven this point in a lot. I'm going to try not to spend too, too long talking about this. But it is really helpful for understanding these things. And later, when we're dealing with other candidate explanations, it's really good at throwing them all out. So what are Einstein's field equations? They are the equations that describe the bending of space-time. A global solution to these equations describes a possible shape for the totality of space-time. What is space-time? If you've been to forum, you've seen it, and you've seen we don't want to deal with that. It's scary. It's weird. But it's, it's like everything. So if we're taking our cues from current well-established science, says Pierce, we should endorse the following principle. Any solution to Einstein's field equation should be assumed to describe a physical possibility unless there are compelling reasons to the contrary. One class of these solutions has the universe beginning at a tiny point and expanding outward, growing larger and larger forever. You all have heard of the Big Bang Theory. That is a solution to Einstein's field equations. But Einstein himself, for most of his life, favored a static solution on which the universe doesn't expand, doesn't contract. It's just a block the whole time. So if we're to respect the idea that all these solutions to the equation describe physical possibilities, then we have to hold that there is a physical possibility that the total sequence of cause and effect in our universe has a beginning or a sequence where it doesn't have a beginning. So we have to allow for both of these things. Why will that matter? We'll figure out later. So now I'm going to go through a couple objections. So the first one is to say, well, we don't need to go to an external thing outside the chain. We just have these chains that are infinite. And so we have a contingent thing as explained by a prior contingent thing, explained by a prior contingent thing, explained by a prior contingent thing, prior contingent thing, prior contingent thing, and it just keeps going on forever. So I don't really like this view. So the first reason, well, better, better actually give it its due. Oh, yeah. So we continue things described by a different thing, kind of like dominoes. Each domino is a previous domino, knocked it over. It's all good. But then the other one's more challenging, scarier. This is the idea of modal collapse. Fancy term. Fancy term equals scary idea. So modal collapse says, well, say we actually are going to take seriously that all contingent stuff is explained by unnecessary stuff. Well, necessary stuff can't really be different. So if you have like 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's the same in everywhere. And so if you have the same thing explaining everything else and it can't be different, then how can 2 plus 2 equals 4 give you more than one result for causing like this chair exists or this chair doesn't? It seems if everything starts at necessary explanation, then it's just going to make everything necessary. And at that point, what we thought was we have all these different possibilities. No, we're only going to end up with one possibility. And this whole stuff we're dealing with of explaining thoughts through contingency, we've actually gotten rid of all the contingency, and we have nothing more to deal with. And if you believe in God and modal collapse, then you've gotten rid of God's free will, because God can only now do one thing. And that seems really sucky. 
So we'd like to avoid those, so I'm objecting to the objections. So for the first one, I'm going to go back to Aristotle for a little bit. This is the Michael translated version of posterior analytics, but the, I assure you the uh, translation works. So Aristotle says, infinite regress would still be no demonstration. So what does he mean by that? He's not saying that it's impossible for an infinite regress to occur. He's just saying it's not a good explanation of anything. So what does he mean by that? Well, you basically, if you're saying this is explained by that and is explained by a previous thing, explained by a previous thing, well, you're just pushing back the explanation. You've never actually gotten around to explaining the whole everything, and it doesn't seem like you're getting anywhere with it. And then there's a more serious problem where if we consider just the chain in its totality. Still appears to be a contingent thing if you want to say, well, we've already agreed contingent stuff can't build a necessary thing. So now you've got a new <coughs> contingent whole that's something other than the parts that made up it. And maybe you can explain every single one of those parts. But now there's a contingent whole, which seems didn't need to exist. And we should probably have an explanation for that. And uh, Gottfried Leibniz in the 17th century said, well, you know, I can imagine this big, big shelf full of books and whatever. Each one of the books is my favorite book, Euclid's Geometry, because he was a nerd or something. And you can say, each, each book, it's just copied from the last version. There was no original author. And he just goes, well, why? Why is there a collection like this? I've explained each book, but I still don't think I'm any closer to understanding why there is such a library in the first place. And maybe more pressingly, why is there a library instead of an aquarium full of awesome seals? Like, I'm not sure I'm justified in making that big of a demand, but like, it doesn't seem a completely unreasonable demand. So I think there's, there's something going on here, which, so that I think this objection to the, to the first argument I'm making, I don't think it's an utterly unreasonable objection, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's quite good enough to satisfy my problems. Right now, it's a metal collapse. Here, I think it's important to get, as David was like, I want a really clear definition of external de explanation. Here's what I was going to do it. But so we want to point out, yes, God is free. So when God explains stuff, God's explanations do not have to be this, therefore, with 100% certainty this, therefore, 100% certainty this. Like, see that sign? What's that sign? Does smoking cause cancer? In the state of California, smoking causes cancer. It doesn't work anywhere else. Audrey's policy, let's not stick to that. Does smoking cause cancer 100% of the time? No. So it doesn't cause cancer. Is that a difference contingency? Probably not. It just means that causing doesn't mean the same thing as 100% of the time the effect happens. So if we just accept that, well, God can be kind of free and choosy in which, what kind of world he wants to create. And the things which God explains, they don't have to be, they can be probabilistic explanations where God goes, all right, I'm going to create this little quantum field, and there's going to be a 50% chance that this particle is up and 50% chance that it's down, and all this kind of like random stuff happens. And it's like, yeah, the stuff's kind of random, but it's still explained within a mathematically explicable physical system in which quantum stuff happens. And you can still end up with all sorts of branching out systems that way. And so it's all fully explained. But that doesn't mean that there isn't any chance involved into the system. So we can have our cake and eat it too, benefit being that God is super free. Not sure if this entirely works, but it's not horrible. Katie? God basically could choose between options before he created? Like an idea that his, he has some sort of knowledge that can reach well, past creation? Well, uh, most Christians are going to buy that anyways. I don't know of any Christian who just goes, yeah, God has no idea at all what is about to happen when he creates. Even like an open theist is going to be totally happy and actually love this picture of there just being a bunch of randomness. But no one goes like, yeah, and then God said, let there be light. Ah, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. <laughs> so now let's get on to the argument I like a little bit better. So 
we're now, in this one, I've made it in a way so that we only need to defend one premise of it. So the total of all dependent things, these are things which require something else for their existence, depends on an ex cannot depend on an external dependent thing. Dependent things depend on external things for their existence, so there's an independent thing which the total of dependent things depends on for its existence. So as you can see, I'm not defending premise one, I'm just proving it. Take external to mean outside of the thing being explained, total of dependent things, all dependent things. If no dependent thing is external to the total of all dependent things. This is just what words mean. Ergo, we get, we get our thing that there is no external dependent thing to the totality of all dependent things. Otherwise, it would, it would be in the dependent things. Does that not make sense to anyone? Ah, Trey. Can you explain what an external thing is? External, it's not one of the things being pointed at. So if we're talking about all the people in the room. External to this group is all the people not in the room. Like when we talk about, say we're talking about all the dependent seals, there's not going to be any seal outside of the class of all the seals, because all seals are seals. So they get stuck in the group of seals. Yeah. David? Is there an internal dependent thing? Something dependent on its parts? Might be, probably. Needing a walls? Yeah, so I think that was the example I gave. But we might say that some things depend also internally, but you might also say that things that depend also on external things. So is it the same logic as basically the total of all blue things cannot depend on an external blue thing? thing, kind of because the property of blueness is wrapped up in all blue things. Yeah, so you might, you might later come to say, well, blue things can be internally explained entirely. I'm just going to say no. I'm about to explain why. So here's my favorite premise in this whole thing that we're going to be discussing. So here is a fancy term that's really old, and you don't really need to worry about it. It's per se. It comes from really old philosophical Latin stuff. I do Greek, Latin is whatever. Not in my Bible, but like. So, I'm gonna go over a, a couple thought experiments, just like two, for me to try to prove my point that dependent things cannot be fully explained by other dependent things. So this example comes roughly from Bill Rowe, who was the atheist who defended this argument. I think the first time I came across it, I was like, Whoa! Blew my freaking mind. So hopeful. I've never had anyone else mind get as blown when I told them. So I've just, I'm hoping that it works this time. So imagine in your bedroom being illuminated in the evening. So we want to, well, the moon, big, bright, round. It's probably the cause of the illumination, right? One sense, yes, the moon is the illuminating. Another sense, no, it's the sun is illuminating the moon, right? Everyone agree? This, this is how the solar system works. So we know moons don't like inherently illuminate stuff. So they're not going to be the ultimate cause of light. But what if we add like a second moon into the mix? So we say our moon was lit by another moon. That was lit by the sun. It's still all good. But if we just add more moons and we take out the sun, if you just have an infinite number of bright, shining moons, like we got over here, look at all the happy moons. They're all shining on each other. Are, are these moons capable of lighting your room up at night? Just got infinite, nope. Obviously not, why? So they are not illuminating. Yeah, they don't have inherent to them the power to illuminate. This is kind of the point of per se, not from itself. Ase means from self, but per se, like not itself. I don't know. I don't speak Latin, right? Se means self or something. But it's the same, this is the same problem as our red bricks, black walls of no matter how many we add, we're never going to get into a situation without some 
sun to resolve this problem. Now, there have been some devastating critiques of this argument. I was reading a blog earlier today which said, actually, you don't need a sun. You just need any steady light source. That was his actual argument. <laughs> As you can see, this was in a blog, not a scholarly paper. But Sam. Uh, is, this, is this model uh, consistent with the flat Earth? <laughs> um, yes. Okay. Good. So I got my, my main point here is that either within this chain or beyond the chain, you need a sun to illuminate the chain or else it's not going to work. And for this later, we will point out a son of God who's pretty good at the job. <laughs> this is what leads people to think that Christmas was based on sun gods. And then I have a, my other example, which is a little easier and shorter to explain. I have a computer right now. It's plugged into a cord. This cord's plugged into other stuff. Suppose I need to charge my computer. I don't. I'm responsible. It's not dying. But I'm going to have to plug it into a wall, right? What if I just plugged it into more cords? Infinite numbers of cords. And I plugged my cords into other cords. You know, you just get a big loop of extension cords. At what point does my computer start charging? Never. Cords don't have the power with them themselves to charge. So I don't have any pun for God being the plug of life, but like, it's another, another circumstance. Katie. Does uh, anyone try to talk about the cords maybe um, spontaneously having an emergent property of charging in the sense that like, okay, if you get enough molecules together into a crystal, at a certain point it has new properties because things in different waves and electron packets combine and then they have a property they didn't once have. Namely like the ability to transfer electrons to the material or something like that. Kinda, sorta, not really. We'll see something close to that in a minute. Audrey. Are the extension cords dependent things, or is the electricity within them a dependent thing? We'll go with the cords themselves are dependent, just because cords themselves do appear dependent. But it seems the thing we are looking for here is just like it was the light was the active thing we were looking for in the last one. This is electricity moving through stuff, but all the moons in that case are also dependent in themselves. But we're more interested in how we contingent things got here. And so now I have one more thought experiment. This one is one I totally made up on my own because it was really frustrating reading something else. And I'll read that later if I can grab it. But so this is my disappearing man thought experiment. I've kind of already brought it up. So um, what if we just got rid of every single law of nature? And if you believe there's like souls connected to bodies or whatever, get rid of every psychophysical law too. Cut all of that out, you know, stop time maybe if you want. Even though time stopped and all of these laws are gone, have you survived? You know, time has been, time has been successfully stopped. It's not like you're going to fall apart. All of the laws are gone, though. There is absolutely nothing holding you together whatsoever. Are you still around? I'm getting a lot of no's. I'm happy. So many people say, of course you are. So I'm going to deal with those objections. So the first objection, which is more popular than saying that electricity emerges from cords, is just to say that I'm making a horrible analogy, and I haven't done any justification for why human dependence is analogous to lights and cords and whatever. So when we look at our parents, you know, our parents, as you can see, at least some of our parents' parents' parents are very dead, but we are alive. So unlike the system where if you took out the sun, suddenly all of the, all of the moons are screwed over, or if you unplug one cord in the chain, then suddenly the computer is no longer charging, it seems those go on, but we can continue to exist even though the parents who made us have stopped existing. And then the other one is not actually from Newton, but it's close enough. This is what I was saying, existential inertia that unless you actively move to take something out of existence, objects in existence will stay in existence unless acted upon by a balanced force. Now, actually, I might as well. I think I might have enough time. 
in this big friggin' book, that objection first came to be try to avoid doing most of the objections in here because they are all level five and above. But he basically said, um, this is Jordan Howard Sobel. He died in like 2006. This is, if you're wondering like, what's the best argument for atheism? This. Um, he was, uh, was he? I was in Australia. Well, he was Australian by birth, but I don't know. He says, I am dependent on things only for my future existence. Take away oxygen and I am dead. Not now, however, but only shortly. Take away heat, it will plunge to absolute zero and I am gone more quickly, but not immediately. Take away the sun. For eight minutes or so, the sun is no part of its efficient sustaining cause, bunch of fancy words and whatever. And he goes, oxygen and the like are at best not sustaining, but perpetuating, and so not necessarily concurrent efficient causes of people. As you can see, he doesn't dumb down his language at all. So that was a bit hard to go through. But that's a basic objection. And I remember reading this for the first time, like junior year of high school, maybe senior year. And I was like, this is the stupidest argument I've ever seen in my life. So there's like three parts in that book that I hate. And that's one of them. So I just had to bring it up. But my response to that argument when we get to there is going to be pretty obvious. But first, I have to defend the more serious objection that dependence is actually analogous. So we do, in fact, depend on our parents, at least for our starting existence. But second of all, we depend on a lot more than just our parents. And the way we depend on our parents is an entirely different type of dependence relationship than the one they were right. That is a different type of dependence relationship than the one being discussed in the situation. But we are in the same type of dependence relationships, that being one that is transitive. So as you can see, we have transitivity down here. Transitivity is when. A explains B, B explains C, well then A also explains C. With the way our parents go, it's A explains B, B explains C, C explains D. There's no overlap in that. But when it comes to like how, well at least not in like, if, one, if A goes away, everything disappears with parents. But with some things where A is pushing the whole thing along, like with the sun and whatever, obviously if A is gone, everything's gone. I'd say with most things like how the laws of physics are being pushed together, and just the total sum of all forces acting upon us from any moment to the other, that's <coughs> going to be more than just, yeah, you're just, you pop into existence, and then you stick around in your existence, and you're just hanging on, and there's nothing sustaining and pushing that effort through. I just don't think that's in any way plausible, unless you take each individual force at a case-by-case -case basis. And I don't think you're really warranted in doing that, especially by focusing on like parents, which is the least constantly sustaining force in your life at any given moment. And onto existential inertia. I think disappearing man is way more obvious than saying, oh yeah, there's this fancy other metaphysical necessary law of the universe which says that you just kind of stick around unless otherwise. I think that's rather extravagant and completely false. And at most, like the parent ones, that, that uh, might explain away. This one might explain away some parts of existence. Sure, maybe if we grant it. On the existential inertia stuff, at the very least, we're still going to have an argument for we need to depend on other things for our current existence. Oh, my heck. It's dead. Whatever. It's back. Um, hmm. It's a dependent thing that happens, yeah. At the very least, we might still we might not get this full like sustaining every moment dependence, but humans will still be dependent because at least we're dependent on something else, and that's really all I need for the argument to go through. And so, if any of y'all get the reference, at least like five of you should, I will applaud you. And they're all Spider-Man to me. Moving on. Okay, now let's actually get to God. So. We have one thing, there's some sort of like, we're going to build a bridge here. We have good enough idea of the universe has some external independent cause, but what type? So first I've got to go through the insufficient solutions, and then we can be happy and parade through the sufficient ones. One-ish. So the first one, this is going to be the closest we get to just a four in difficulty. 
is um, priority monists. And what do priority monists say? They say, well, of course you can't have red stuff build a black wall or whatever, but a big hole might be able to explain its parts the other way around. And so priority monists say the whole universe in its totality, that's the fundamental thing. And then it explains its parts. And so I think that if we have to accept Einstein's field equations as physical possibilities, this one's kind of screwed. Because we can say, well, the whole universe, our whole universe started to exist. But it's totally physically possible for a static block universe to exist. So one of these is a universe that has a finite past. The other has an infinite past. These are very different universes. So you can't say there's one necessary universe if it's clearly not the same universe as the one that has an infinite past. So that's one issue where the priority monist fails. And I, I should mention, not everyone in philosophy these days fits into one of the two camps I'm going to bring up. Obviously, there are people who fit into ours. And there was another camp, but we'll get to that for a teensy bit. But most philosophers do accept at least one of the first two arguments I've made. And this is, this is kind of, I'm going over in this one slide some 60, 70% of all philosophers. And a lot of it by just collapsing everyone into one of these two groups. But close enough, who cares? And then junk. What is junk? I'm sure you'd like to know. I won't tell you yet. So let's talk about pluralist. Pluralist are the opposites. They say, you got a bunch of really, really small stuff. The smallest stuff, you can't get smaller. All the small stuff, that is necessary, and it builds up the big stuff. You know, matter cannot be created or destroyed, except for the fact that matter can definitely be created or destroyed. That's also a problem for these people. You'll find that most philosophers arguing against each other are like, yeah, um, neither of you can explain physics whatsoever. <laughs> but, so I think there's another issue of, oh yeah, if these things, these smallest pieces have a finite history or it could be infinite, that's going to be a serious problem for your view. Maybe not as serious for this one because you could be like, well, they start out as a tiny clump and then they explode out in a big bang and whatever. It's all fine. So I don't think it's as big of a problem with this one, but it's very hard to explain this part. So now you want to know what is junk and what is gunk and why do serious philosophers talk about it? Me too. But the idea of gunk came before junk. And so gunk says every object is made of smaller parts. Just imagine that possibility. Junk says every object is part of a bigger part. And so, just imagine, is it possible that there's a junky world where there's the small stuff and that builds a bigger stuff and that builds bigger stuff and you build a universe and you build like multiverses and multiverses build bigger multiverses and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Bit weird, probably not as weird as the idea that the whole universe explains all of its parts, but like weird. But then I'll compare that to a gunky universe where the further you go, you can just keep splitting down atoms into quarks and quarks into whatever is less than quarks. We don't know yet, but maybe there's more. Do you all think either of those are plausible? Apparently Sam not. I think they're both fairly plausible. I think every time we've thought like, oh, we've hit the limit. This is as small as things go. We've been able to find it go smaller. And so I don't think either of these are probably true for our world. But I think there's definitely a distinct possibility that these could happen. And if there's a distinct possibility these can happen, well, if gunk's possible, then priority pluralists who say there's a necessary smallest thing, they're screwed. If junk's possible, well, then monists who say there's a necessary biggest thing, they're screwed. But theist, we can say, sure, you can even have hunk, a real philosophical term, where there, every object is both part of a bigger part and is made of smaller parts. Yes, Sam? I agree with you now. <coughs> okay. So with Hunk, you could still have, like the moon scenario, God outside the chain explaining things that go smaller and smaller and smaller and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so the majority of philosophers, I wager, who reject either monism or pluralism do so because they think Hunk's very plausible. But they're not thinking about like God outside the universe that could explain these things. And so they reject this like foundational picture 
where there is like a bottom explanation. But I think that has serious problems because we've already gone over those. So theism, though, we can explain away the biggest problem that monists throw at pluralists and pluralists throw at monists and people who are neither throw at both of them. And so we can just explain it all. And I think that's definitely a benefit. So what are the sufficient solutions? <coughs> Looks like we got a couple. So we got God, but why think from God to perfect God? You know, why not God who's just the computer nerd who created a simulation universe or God is the Mormon deity who's finite but made a universe, you know? Why our cooler God perfectly? Or is it something practically perfect in every way? The Mary Poppins God? All right. Well, simple enough. It's the least arbitrary contrived thing that we can come up with. Going purely from our own reason, we go, imagine like, oh, what explanation could we go with? If we're going to ascribe arbitrary parameters to it, it just seems weird. It'd be like, oh, yeah, it's, it's a god who can only create a Googleplex of particles. One more, it's, that's too hard. Or, you know, something like that. It seems really arbitrary to say it's anything other than, like, just the best. And this also ensures, if God is perfect, that God isn't going to be a further dependent being. And we don't have to go back to another source that explains why God is dependent on that. So if God's perfect, well, a perfect being doesn't have to rely on anything else to exist. So we can be confident with a being that couldn't be any better, that there's not going to be anything further that we need to push the explanation on. And we can know we have a stop to our explanation here. And at least if God's purely perfect, then there's no meaningful way in which God could be like altered in a way that makes God different enough for it to be different. Like God might choose, make different choices, but God's actual internal whatever is never going to go from perfect to anything different. God will always be essentially the same. Katie? Well, is there a simple way to explain why if God makes, could make different choices or has this freedom, he couldn't be essentially different? Because it seems like this freedom would give him some sort of dependency. Like he could have done one thing or, or done another. Well, I'd say your ability to do one thing or another doesn't make you yourself contingent. Your choices might be contingent, but you are not your choices. So that's the basic idea is God's perfect and it's not a mystery why God is necessary and independent. And so we're not just appealing to further mystery to explain mysteries because mystery to explain mystery is usually not a great explanation of mystery. And um, on to that, well, there, are there problems with this theory? Sure, but who the heck cares? So. There's a lot of other problems with monism and pluralism that I didn't get into because those are problems independent of can they explain this specific fact? Because that's all we're worried about here is are there problems of the problem of evil, hiddenness, religious diversity, blah, 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 anything and everything under the sun, arguments against God? Sure, whatever. We can deal with those later. But, <coughs> dang it, Julie, you're, you're causing, me, causing me to cough. Um, um, what we're dealing with is one specific data point of who can explain contingency. And it seems like this is an answer that's yes and everything else is more or less an answer that's no. So at least on this data point, they can confidently say, if we should prefer the best explanation in town, God is the best explanation of contingency. Maybe later we'll come to find God isn't the explanation, best explanation of evil, but that's a completely different lecture and completely different point. All I'm trying to get here today is that I came in with some puzzle that we need to explain. We thought everything might need an external explanation, but that just can't be the case because the whole of it can't. Well, so what's that thing inside the whole that is itself not requiring an explanation? It's going to be God. The best explanation we have of this matter, absent ceteris paribus, you know, all else being equal. We might have to come back a later date with our other arguments to deal with external arguments against this view. But on this specific data point, theism runs circles around everyone else.
more or less, you know? So my conclusions here are modest, but just in case, I would like to engage in a little bit of Jesus smuggling and point out, you know, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, specifically the part where, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so is God here specifically referring about the argument that I just made? Probably not, but like, it fits, it makes sense, they're close enough. And then Zach added, uh, he's got the whole world in his, good enough, good enough, you know. So, sure, we can't say, oh yes, proves Christianity because of three Bible verses taken slightly out of context, but like, there's something there. There's something to this argument which appears to be recognized in scripture. And so I like that fact about this argument. Yeah, I'm a modest guy. I don't try to get it all in one argument or whatever. Next week we'll have a different argument on completely different stuff. But like, I think this gets us, this puts us in a good position. It's a place we want to be. And so what are the takeaways? Going through basically just pure reason, we can figure out deep and insightful truths about fundamental reality, that there's at least one good argument for the existence of God that does not require a prior predisposition for faith, and that maybe when you go out into the world now and observe the radical contingency of everything, you might go, oh yeah, thanks God for constantly sustaining me in every single infinitely divisible metric of time through all of these factors all around me keeping me in one piece and being like, oh yeah, maybe God's not so distant even when he feels like it sometimes because my hand doesn't fall off. So we now can move on to the afterthought.